pictures for you, so you don't need to look at me all the time. <laughs> and um, unfortunately, you have to listen to <laughs> you have to listen to my voice, which is struggling a little bit. But I will um, I will do my best to, to get us through. Um, I want to take a step back uh, and and talk about um, the larger trends we're seeing in the repression of Palestine activism. Uh, Palestine Solidarity Legal Support is an organization that I started two years ago. And uh, what we do is, is to basically represent and support activists around the country who are facing backlash for standing up um, and, and speaking out about Palestine. Um, so as you, as you can imagine, we've been incredibly busy over the last two years uh, helping folks uh, deal with, with the relentless, uh, relentless attacks on, on them for, uh, for their speech activities, basically. We're talking um, almost exclusively, exclusively about activities that, are, that ought to be protected by the First Amendment here. Um, and, and that includes a range of things, including boycotts and uh, street theater and um, you know, all kinds of activities that, that our Constitution um, supposedly protects. Um, so I think Professor Fadiki here gave a bit of, a, uh, of an overview of the kind of state of things in this country right now. Uh, there's an undeniable rise in activism around Palestine, and I think that's been fueled uh, partly by two th uh, the ca uh, Operation Cast Lead in 2008-2009. Certainly, this summer's assault on Gaza uh, fueled a lot of uh, uh, outpouring, uh, an outpouring of, of support and uh, protest around the country. Um, and, and of course, the, the growth of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, especially since 2005. Um, uh, we are seeing the vast majority of activism happening on college campuses. It's young people who are passionate, who, are, who uh, might not have the kinds, of, uh, the kinds of inhibitions that their parents have had about speaking out about Palestine in this country. Um, uh, and, and they are out there, they are taking risks, they are um, uh, confronting the issue full on. Um, so, so I think that's one reason anyway that, we're, that, that a lot of this is happening on campuses. And um, as he also mentioned, because of this rise in activism, we're seeing a, an immense amount of attention um, uh, being placed on this by uh, a, a large number of uh, pro-Israel Zionist groups in this country, who, um, uh, you know, also at the behest of the Israeli government, are intent on uh, silencing, crushing, um, criminalizing this kind of activity. Um, so what I want to talk about is, and, and sorry, and you know, the, the problem I think in Rasmia's case illustrates this as well is that the U.S. government follows suit. Um, and so through, through a number of ways. Um, one of those ways is surveillance and infiltration, um, as well as criminal prosecutions. Um, now, the other realm of repression that's happening is, is, a, a, is a result of uh, the immense pressure that Zionist groups are placing on uh, universities, especially um, as well as other institutions and government agencies. And uh, because of that, we're seeing a, a, a disparate treatment of uh, activists. And, and I'll talk more about that. As well as uh, some changing of the rules that I think Stephen's case also uh, illustrates. And then, of course, we have uh, uh, lawsuits and legislation um, attempting to, uh, to disrupt and um, derail this kind of activism. Um, and I just want, just to give you a sense of, of the volume of, uh, of what we're seeing here, just in the last year, uh, PSLS has documented, has had reported to us over 215 cases of uh, repression. 
and, and requests for, for legal assistance. So, uh, you know, and, and this is just folks who know about us, folks who, you know, feel comfortable enough to call us. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, you know, they could be small cases of, uh, uh, you know, a student group not being able to, uh, you know, hold an event, but they're also as big as a lawsuit or a criminal prosecution. Um, so, so the volume is, is immense the, and uh, pretty overwhelming, uh, frankly. We, we had no idea uh, how pervasive uh, uh, this problem was. So um, surveillance and infiltration. I think by now we all know what the NSA is doing. Uh, we all know what the NYPD uh, has done in New York City. Um, you know, visiting coffee shops and barber shops and mosques and uh, you know every every place that Muslim can be found, um, and gathering all of this information. Uh, you know, this this surveillance of the government has been focused on the imams of community, especially Arab, Middle Eastern, um, <laughs> South Asian, Muslim South Asian uh, community, especially and. Uh, uh, we also know that it's been focused on activism, on uh, progressive activism, and not just Palestinian, Palestine solidarity activism. I mean, we're talking about Occupy, we're talking about the environmental rights movement, we're talking about the animal rights movement, the immigrant rights movement. You know, it's, it's not um, singular, it's, it, it's not exceptional uh, for the Palestine solidarity movement, um, and certainly not in history as we know from COINTELPRO and, and the targeting of the civil rights movement, etc., the American Indian movement, Puerto Rican independence movement. Um, <clears throat> but what we're seeing is that there is a focus on the Palestine solidarity movement as well. And, uh, you know, the, this takes the form of FBI visits to activists to ask them about their, what they're doing. Um, uh, you know, we see student groups have found bugs in their prayer rooms uh, at school. Um, we've seen, um, you know, I think uh, Andrew mentioned the, uh, um, the subpoenas of 23 anti-war activists in the Midwest. This was based on uh, an agent uh, uh, infiltrating the, the, the group that they were working with uh, for two years, was it? Uh, a long time. Uh, and trying to ca catch them in, a, in, in some kind of illegal activity. Four years later, there's no indictment, um, but but there's clearly a focus on this, and there's a lot of suspicion and uh, uh, unease among students, especially about you know who's an infiltrator. There's got to be somebody among us, you know, who who is is spying on us here. So, it, you know, as it as happened with the civil rights movement, it's a way to uh, intimidate and uh, and try to. Uh, um, uh, cause imbalance in, in these kinds of effective advocacy movements. Criminal prosecution. I won't talk about Rasmia's case. I think um, Andrew did a great job of, of making the connection of that and, and efforts to, to intimidate um, the, the movement as a whole and its connection with the, the Midwest subpoena case. But um, we have seen a lot of cases, you know, certainly since 9-11, uh, targeting Palestinian Americans specifically, often for fundraising, for allegedly, um, uh, uh, you know, materially supporting terrorist organizations. So we have the case of the Holy Land Five. Um, uh, we have the case of Sami Adian, who was a professor in Florida. Um, and his conviction, or his case was based mainly on his advocacy, his speech, and his writing, and etc. Uh, we have the case of Mohammed Salah, who was uh, accused of taking money to Hamas before it was even a, a registered as a terrorist organization, um, at, at two Zakat committees that even U.S. aid had given money to, right? This was also the case for the Holy Land Foundation. So you have all these kinds of uh, so-called material support cases that really cause a chill in the community, that chill um, charity efforts, that, that chill advocacy on, really? <laughs> oh, 
uh, chill advocacy efforts. Um, you know, we see less of uh, we see less criminal prosecutions in the the student activism arena. One uh, one exception, one extreme exception, was the conviction of students for interrupting Michael Oren's speech at UC Irvine. I don't know if you all heard about that case, but uh, you know they. Uh, it was a popcorn demonstration. One after another, they shouted out uh, um, statements uh, during Michael Oren's lecture at UC Irvine. And they were convicted of a, for, uh, based on an obscure California statute disrupting a public meeting. So, um, so these kinds of prosecutions, again, are, uh, are, are really chilling and intimidating. Uh, and I, I won't go into some of the, the common themes we see in these, which which is really a, a very close cooperation with Israel uh, to gather evidence, to bring you know, Shin Bet agents to testify in court anonymously. Um, it's, it's really uh, an amazing uh, underworld, so to speak, going on in these kinds of, of criminal prosecutions. Um, disparate treatment. I think uh, you know, this, is, this is something that uh, uh, what we mean by this is basically different treatment of people because of, of what they're saying. And this, the First Amendment is really meant to protect uh, exa uh, against exactly that. Uh, it's supposed to protect uh, you know, any viewpoint, uh, however unpopular it is, from um, unequal treatment by the government. But, but nevertheless, we're seeing this happen a lot. And one way is through administrative harassment. Uh, it sounds really boring. It sounds kind of, uh, 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 you know, not very interesting. But um, it, it's really pervasive, and its effect it is very chilling to students, especially. And, and I'm talking about this mostly in the student context. But you know, you have student groups who can't reserve a space. You know, they're told, "Oh, it's taken. Sorry." Um, they are um, not allowed to to. Uh, um, publicize their events until it's approved, and it doesn't get approved until a few, couple days before. Things like that really affect students' ability to organize, and this has been a consistent problem at CUNY, including with your talk recently, uh, Steve. Um, that things like additional security costs are being imposed on student groups, and this is a really uh, uh, prohibitive thing. I mean, student groups don't have a lot of money, and when they say, oh, your, your event is controversial, um, you need security, and you have to pay for it. Um, what, what does that mean for them? Uh, we've, we've heard from student groups who have been told you can't use the, the, the name SJP, Students for Justice in Palestine. You can't use the word apartheid. You can't use the word Palestine, literally. Um, and, uh, you know, these are fundamental First Amendment violations. In the private school context, it's harder to challenge them, but, uh, but that's what we help students to do. Um, and the second way is, is through disciplinary procedures and, and really the, the unequal application of rules. So in Stephen's case, you see that the, you know, all of a sudden the Board of Trustees has a say in who gets hired and who's qualified and who's fit to teach. This has never happened before. It's a rubber stamp, uh, you know, a clear kind of uh, unequal application of, of, of procedures and rules. Um, at Northeastern University, uh, they, they distributed these mock eviction notices, um, and uh, you know they got in trouble for it. They got suspended uh, for allegedly violating rules about flyering. Of course, you know how many flyers do students get under their doors? How many people get disciplined for those? Unequal application of the rules. It recently happened at Loyola University where students were lined up to register, Palestinian students lined up to register at a birthright Israel table, saying, hey, I have a birthright, why can't I go? Um, uh, to really to highlight its discriminatory nature against Palestinians. Immediately, uh, Hillel students who were doing the tabling complained to the administration, saying, we feel unsafe, we feel threatened, uh, this is uh, discrimination. Uh, and uh, you know they violated all of these rules. They should have registered their demonstration 14 days ahead of time, as the um, rules require, even though they had just heard about it the night before. So uh, what happens? They have to go to a hearing, um, and they're found 
responsible, not for all the discrimination charges against them, which is a good thing. I think the administration realized that's, that's just not credible. Um, but they got uh, found uh, responsible for, uh, for not registering their demonstration. Hillel also had not registered their tabling event and got a slap on the wrist. While, um, loyal, uh, while SJP was put on probation for a year, meaning they cannot get money. They cannot you know, uh, put on events that, that they would have put on other times. Oops, I'm going to go back. <laughs> sorry, changing the rules. Um, previous, no, sorry. I have to wrap up, but I just want to make a couple more points. Changing the rules. Um, we see this again and again. It happened at uh, Brooklyn College last year after this BDS event with Omar Barhouti and uh, Judith Butler. Uh, got all of the New York politicians up in a, what do you mean to call it? Um, in a tizzy, thank you. Um, and uh, right afterwards, Brooklyn College changed all of its policies on security fees and uh, you know RSVPs for events and um, uh, all, all of these other rules, specifically in response to SJP's event. It happened at Barnard College, where students put up this banner. The next day, it was taken down uh, by the administration, who had approved it and put it up, uh, because of complaints from Hillel students saying, this doesn't make me feel safe because it erases Israel from the map. Um, you know, <laughs> Barnard right away said, no more banners. You know, these are banners that have been up for, uh, for decades at, at Barnard that student groups uh, put up. Um, so instead of confronting the issues, dealing with the, with the discord, with the disagreement, uh, they just changed the rules to make it more difficult. Um, inciting law enforcement investigations. This really relates to the fact that um, uh, all these Zionist organizations are, make a point of accusing students of material support for terrorism. Oh, they're having a fundraiser. It must be going to Hamas. Um, you know, uh, making, trying to make these connections. SJP has connections to Hamas. These are really inflammatory, really dangerous accusations that are completely baseless. Um, and uh, what they do is bring government scrutiny, law enforcement scrutiny, on these activists and on these groups. Um, and, and, and it's really chilling. Uh, and, Damaging cyberbullying. You won't imagine the nasty, Islamophobic, misogynistic death threats, rape threats that, that we see coming to activists for speaking out. It's really uh, disturbing. Um, lawsuits, this should probably have been up front, so I'm going to talk about it more. I'm going to leave to Yemen the, the use of the Civil Rights Act to attack. Uh, student activism, but we're also seeing a lot of threats against BDS through lawsuits. So we have the Olympia Food Co op boycott, um, boycott lawsuit from a few years ago, which is now an appeal in the Washington Supreme Court, um, trying to nullify the, the Olympia uh, Food Co op's boycott. We, after the ASA, the American Studies Association, what academic boycott resolution last year, last December, there were lawsuit threats against the ASA claiming discrimination. Um, no, no suits have been filed, but we're seeing these happening in other countries, and they're clearly um, uh, targeting uh, BDS in this way. And finally, legislation. Um, again, after the ASA boycott, we saw legislation in six states, at least, and the US Congress tried to defund universities that fund their professors going to ASA events or uh, association events where you know, they, they endorse boycotts. Um, and, and, you know, with coalitions, we managed to defeat a lot of this legislation, including in Maryland. Um, but, you know, Congress is capable of anything, and I think Yemen will, will talk uh, also about another uh, uh, legislative effort happening right now that you all should be aware of. So I'll, I went way too long, I'm sorry. Um, but I, I will just end saying, um, you know, while the effect of this is really damaging and chilling, it's also not working that well um, at the same time. Uh, a lot of these efforts are failing, and it's because of the First Amendment partly, but it's also because of the fact that people are refusing to be intimidated, and uh, you know they, they are 
uh, showing support for an SME, uh, uh, where you know, 10, 20 years ago that may not have been the case. Um, so, so it's heartening to see the, uh, the number of people who are willing to stick their necks out and stand up and, and not be silenced. Thank you.